On the Melbourne Cricket Ground, home of Australia's most fervent cricket followers, in one day, more than 90,000 people have packed in to see the last test match of the 1960-61 series between Australia and the West Indies. Never has a more exciting rubber been played. Only in the final hour of the last test was the series decided and the scenes of enthusiasm that followed overwhelmed the traditional dignity of the game as the spectators rushed onto the field in search of souvenirs. Cricket came to Australia with the first settlers and at once became acclimatised. Today, the game is played in every corner of the continent and has even spread to Australia's trust territories. Throughout the Australian summer, while the Northern Hemisphere is in the grip of winter, cricket is played by young and old, in city and outback, and on grounds large and small. When one talks of cricket in Australia, immediately your mind turns to Don Bradman. Sir Donald, do you think the tremendous success of the West Indies tour is a sign of renewed interest in cricket? Will it have any sustained influence on the type of cricket to be played in the future? Yes, Vic, I do. I certainly hope so. I think in recent years, uh, cricket has tended rather to get a little bit on the slow side and I feel it's been necessary to revive uh, the knowledge in the minds of the people that you can play bright and attractive cricket and still play it in the true test atmosphere. That a fellow can hit a ball for four which will bounce back off the fence about ten yards and still be a safer shot than if he hits it twenty yards. I think the whole um, atmosphere that has been created this season has gone right throughout the world and it will be reflected in years to come. Well Don, uh, how do conditions in Australia compare with other countries such as England? As a general rule Vic, I think Australian pitches would be harder than English pitches and would be faster. Probably West Indian pitches would be the truest in the world and the most ideal to bat on. Not sure that the bowlers think they're the best. And I think from your experience you'd say that South African pitches are very good, they're hard, but a little slower and turn more than Australian pitches. New Zealand pitches, much more like the English ones. Are there any particular reasons why we are a successful cricketing country? That's a question that's been asked often, Vic. I think our climate lends itself to outdoor sports of all kinds. I think the physique of our nation is very good, and I think the, the youngsters like to get out of, out of doors and play sports. Um, we have a certain tradition and a certain history in cricket too, you know, and I think the boys are brought up on that. Every Australian youngster has the opportunity to play cricket, and, if he wishes, of learning to play it well. Most primary schools have one sports day a week, and many schools have room for practice in the school ground. Where the school has no playing fields adjoining, buses take the pupils to sports grounds on their weekly sports afternoon. By the time the boy reaches high school, competition is key and the outstanding cricketers are already beginning to show themselves. Coaches for the very young are provided by senior grade and district teams. Older players and fathers voluntarily give up their time to start the boys along the right track. In this way, the young cricketer learns the fundamental principles of the game at an early age, before he has a chance to form bad habits. It takes many years of concentrated training and practice to become a first-class cricketer. Australian colleges are proud of their record of first-class cricketers. With good pitches and the excellent facilities at their command, the colleges are able to produce boys ready to take their place in first-grade cricket. 
On the Sydney Cricket Ground, Bert Oldfield is instructing country boys 14 to 17 years of age. Once a year, the most promising boys from the country districts of New South Wales are invited to the city for a week. It's a quarter of a century since Bert Oldfield put up a wicket-keeping record of 130 wickets for Australia. Now he passes on the lessons he learned behind the stumps, such as the correct method of taking a ball outside the batsman's legs. Fast bowler Frank Misson talks on the techniques of seam bowling. And he shows the various grips. The slips machine is to quicken reflexes of players who field in position behind the wicket. Nowadays, catches considered almost impossible a few years ago are expected from every fieldsman. Graham Thomas, one of Australia's up and coming batsmen, demonstrates the hook shot. By rolling the wrists, he plays the ball down onto the ground. Brian Booth has learnt over the years that you must keep the gap between the bat and the pads closed or the ball will get through. On the Sydney cricket ground, West Australia is playing New South Wales in a Sheffield Shield match. The Shield was presented by Lord Sheffield in 1892 for competition between the states. To play for his state in a Sheffield Shield match is the young player's stepping stone to international cricket. Australian test selectors watch these matches to pick cricketers to represent their country. Cricketers in Australia are not professionals, but have their jobs. Norman O'Neill is a representative for a cigarette firm. Colin McDonald works in insurance. Neil Harvey is a salesman for a glass manufacturing company. Alan Davidson works in a bank. 19-year-old Graham McKenzie is a schoolmaster, teaching physical education. This also helps to keep him fit for cricket. Great emphasis is placed on physical fitness, for cricketers must be prepared to play hard, five-day tests in a variety of temperatures and under all conditions. At the Melbourne Cricket Ground, the curator uncovers the pitch with loving care. For months, he has nurtured and tended this piece of ground to make a wicket that will remain in good condition for five or six playing days. Australians will come hundreds of miles to see an exciting game, and queues stretch back into Yarra Park before the start of a match between the West Indies and Australia. Crowds from the city come down paths shaded by great elms brought from England and planted last century much like the game of cricket itself. For Worrell, popular West Indies captain, this is an unforgettable occasion, his last appearance in Test cricket. The heroes of the day, of course, are the players, and young autograph hunters are everywhere. Tossing the fateful coin is a moment of tension. Australia wins, but Captain Benno sends the West Indies into bat. So the Australians take the field. Hence, hush ground awaits the opening ball. Davidson bowls to Cammy Smith. Smith forces the ball away to leg.
Davison to Sobers. Outstanding all-rounder. Equally proficient with battle ball. Captain Benno and Simpson have a conference and plan the strategy of the Australian attack. Simpson bowls. Sobers is caught behind by Wally Brown. Benno prepares to bowl. As the Governor of Victoria, the Prime Minister, the Premier of Victoria, and the leader of the Federal Opposition, watch. Benno bowls to Wall. Wall hits him for four. Nissen, a new member of Australia's speed attack, bowls to Jerry Alexander, West Indies wicketkeeper. Always good for runs at a critical stage. As the players leave the field for lunch, hampers and thermos flasks appear. It's part of the fun of a day at the test. It's Australia's turn to bat. Wesley Hall, perhaps the fastest international bowler in the world today, takes up the attack to Simpson. McDonald, Australia's other opening batsman, ducks a bumper from Hall. Hall again to McDonald. One run. Another ball from Hall. And McDonald is out. Richie Benno has proved himself a shrewd captain and a fine player in every department of the game. Peter Burge carries on the bright cricket. Captain Neil Harvey is a popular vice captain. So, the best traditions of cricket help to strengthen the ties between nations of the Commonwealth. The exhilaration of the match sends the thoughts of old timers in the crowd back to famous matches and famous cricketers of the past. Don Bradman in his heyday, driving the ball to the fence or using his famous hook. And Keith Miller, equally at home, bowling or batting. Bill O'Reilly, known to everyone as the Tiger. And Ray Lindwall, who took more test wickets for Australia than any other bowler. They recall the visit of the team from India in 1947, with Armanath, Hazari and Mancat outstanding. They remember the continuous struggle between England and Australia, which had been going on since the 1880s. At Brisbane in 1958, Peter May's team carries on in the best tradition of the sport. Loder and Truman take up the attack. Benno to May, and the age-old battle for the Ashes goes on. Some great players of the past are on hand too for the Prime Minister's match in the national capital, Canberra. At the end of each test series, 
it has become a tradition for the visitors to play a team selected by the Prime Minister. Ray Linwell and Lindsay Hassett lend their support for the toss. And what of the future? Each year, in a different capital city, a cricket carnival is held for schoolboys under the age of 14, selected after competition in each state. Here in Brisbane, boys from New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia and Western Australia are making their first venture into the stresses of interstate contests. Great cricketers show their ability early and the form of players at these carnivals is carefully noted. The test players of tomorrow are to be found amongst these youngsters and others like them. In their hands lies the future of Australian cricket. 